Okay, so uh, now I'm going to show one more application. It's a pretty cool application of segment trees. So it is kind of a new data structure in and of itself. It's called a range tree. So uh, basically, it's a certain specific application of a segment tree. Uh, in a very like concrete way, we can explain exactly how it's like a segment tree. Uh, but so the motivating problem is kind of like this. So we have uh, you know coordinates. So we have like a y and x, and this represents a map. And on the map, we have uh, temperature sensors. Like you know, these are sensing temperatures at various places in the map. Now these are not necessarily uniformly distributed. They're just kind of all over the place wherever somebody had a chance to stick a temperature sensor. Um, now, what we want to do is we basically want to get the average temperature of a region. So, uh, what we want to build is something where somebody like drags a box. We drag a box, uh, like you know, my drawing is bad, but assume these lines are parallel to the x and y axis. Uh, somebody's like dragging a box on their computer, and. Uh, Basically, what we want to do is we want to say how many temperature sensors do we have within this box and what's like their average reading in this box. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, we'll start with kind of like the static version of this problem. But what, what I mean by static is, uh, you know, like the points aren't, the, the, these like X's, these points, they're not moving and we're not adding or removing any points. Uh, we just want to like make this efficiently queryable. So uh, in this problem, we, we uh, are allowed to basically uh, pre-process the points. We're given a chance to pre-process the points, and then, and then we have to answer rectangle queries efficiently, more efficiently than just uh, linear time. Uh, so what uh, does uh, what, what is linear time? mean here, well, of course you could uh, you know, answer any query you want by looking through all the points and doing like a quick check, is it inside the rectangle or not. Uh, so, but, but we want to do better than this. We want to find like basically a sublinear time algorithm. So let's focus on one of the, one of the sub problems first, like rather than like the average of the points, so clearly, average can be broken into two parts. If we want like the average reading, we can count how many points there are and what, what is their total sum. If that makes sense, right? Like, like it's fine if we if we just manage, manage to count their total sum and we manage to count how many there are, then we can get the average like easy enough. So let's start with um, just a counting problem. Like, how do we know how many points there are? Well, so. Uh, okay, how would you solve the one-dimensional version of this problem is the thing you have to ask first. Okay, so let's, well, let's look at it. So you, in the one-dimensional version, you, have a, you basically just have like a number line, and you have points on it, right? And then you're basically given a range, and you're asked how many things are within that range. So how do you solve that? What are your ideas? Well, like this one shouldn't be hard. You can't just store zeros and Well, storing zeros and ones, uh, maybe not the greatest idea here because like these are kind of like real numbers, maybe. Uh, you, you know, like like we're not we're not necessarily saying that uh, these have like very small coordinates. Uh, it could be that these are kind of like more like real values. So. We don't directly want to store like at every position like a zero or one indicating whether there's something there. We kind of want to store it more as like a number line, like okay, this one is at position 10.25, and this one is at position like 13, and this one's at position, you know, 376. We don't want to store like each individual value. Uh, so yeah, we do have to store them in some data structure though. Well, it's not a sliding window because the problem is given a query window. Like in the 1D problem, we'll be given a query which has the form basically x1, x2. Like in this version, it'll be x1, x2, y1, y2. But here we're going to be given like a sliding window, like or you know not a sliding window, but just like a window, like x1, x2. 
and we have to count how many points are in here. So how should we store the points, do you think? Binary tree. Binary tree. Yeah, binary tree is an idea. Um, we could also even just go ahead for like a regular uh, array, array, like a sorted array. If it's static, like you're right, like if it's a dynamic version of this problem where points are being added and removed, we'll need to go for a uh, binary tree. And in fact, not just a simple binary tree, it'll have to be what's called uh, order statistic tree, right? A what? Uh, it'll have to be what's called an order statistic tree. <coughs> if you don't know what that is, I'll explain later. Um, you will consider that in just a moment. Uh, we'll see like why like a regular binary tree is not quite enough here. So, a bi so you know, the idea is like we can just store these as an array, right? We'll just store these as an array. Um, what will the array have? Well, like just an array of x coordinates. So let, let's say we kind of store these points and maybe, the, I don't know, maybe they look like this. And let's say we get a query that is like query from 75 to 150, right? What do we do with this array now? Yeah, binary search. It has to be like a modified version of binary search that searches for, you know, not just the, not, not just tries to find the value, but tries to find, you know, the boundary, right? So for example, what we would like here is we would like, uh, when we search for this, we would we'll first search for this 75. <coughs> Sorry, I'm still a little recovering from a cold. <laughs> Uh, so if it's like 75, we hope to find basically uh, this number. Or, or we can find this 100 too, that, that's fine. Uh, either, either way you implement the boundary, well let's say we decide to find this 100. So we'll basically say we want to find the smallest number that is larger than the boundary. And then this one we want to do in the other direction, we want to find the... Mm, well, uh, I wanted this to be like 250. <coughs> we want to find the, yeah, the, the largest number that is smaller, so we will find this one, and then that'll be our range. Or, you know, if we, it's probably easier to do half range, then we can reuse this procedure. Uh, if we just reuse the procedure, we'll find the 300, and that gives us the, uh, you know, half, uh, that, that gives us the half range notation, like the excluding the last index, including the first. So we will use binary search to find, you know, this kind of, like this is sometimes called a, like a ceiling or a successor of the value. So here in this array, the successor of 75 is 100, the successor of 250 is 300. We will do the successor search and we will find this. Um, you know, little known fact, and like, I, I'm not gonna like at all explain how this works, but there, there actually like is like this really kind of crazy advanced data structure that actually can do this successor operation faster than, uh, or in some cases faster, like depending on uh, some parameters, uh, in some cases faster than uh, binary search. And th this is just like, uh, this is like this weird thing called uh, the von M. de Boas tree. It's like a special data structure that's designed for successor operations. Uh, basically finding what, what is the element in the set that like like what is the next largest what what is the element in the set that is the next largest after like a current value that you give and so and that one is only efficient if these like coordinates are like fairly small they don't have to be like one to n but if the coordinates are in like a fairly small range then that one it can be like more efficient than a binary search tree but that's like a really wild data structure but you know just interesting. Uh, that you actually maybe binary search is not necessarily the last word on you know what uh, what can be the most efficient algorithm here because most people think like there's not going to be anything that's possibly better than binary search for this right but in any case binary search is a great solution uh, uh, you know like here we pretty quickly kind of find the bounds we find this element and this element and we conclude that basically that means that these elements are within our range. Now, <clears throat> uh, how could you possibly extend this to two dimensions? So give it a thought. So it's not like super easy. 
But, you know, like, like to give you a hint, I'll say that uh, there was a reason why, you know, I showed the 1D problem first. <clears throat> so what do you think? Well, okay, here's like, here's like one solution, and this is like not like the greatest solution. And this doesn't, isn't guaranteed to be better than linear time, but it, it does like intuitively feel like it's quite an improvement. Uh, it's not like worst case better than linear time, but what we could do is we could still store the points sorted by like our choice of coordinate. So let, like let's store the points sorted by x coordinate. Uh, so we'll store like all of these points sorted by x. Uh, their y's will of course not be sorted if they're sorted by x. Uh, or you know we can sort by y on a, as a secondary criterion, but it's not going to help much because maybe like the x of each and every one of these points is distinct, so maybe it won't make a difference. Or maybe it's not the same, uh, but it doesn't matter. We can't, be, we can't be assured that every point doesn't have a different x coordinate. So if we sort by x, we kind of have to accept that in no, by no, like, in no way whatsoever is the input, can, be, can the input said to be said to be sorted by y, even if we were to use y as like a secondary sort, sorting criterion. Because it could be that like nothing has, a, has the same x anyway. Uh, but how does this help? Well, it helps quite a lot in that we can like quickly narrow down the range of, of the points we should look at, right? So if the points are sorted by x, when you get this query, like let's say there's more stuff out here. When you get this query, you will immediately narrow it down through a binary search to just this subrange, right? So you will, you, you will just have to visit these points and you will eliminate these and eliminate that. So that, that seems pretty good. But of course, like there could be a ton of stuff out here, right? So, you know, wouldn't it be great if, like, like, there could be, a, how many points are out here? Like, it depends on how large this range is, but possibly uh, it is, you know, linear, right? Whereas before, in the 1D solution, our algorithm was actually log time for counting the points. Because in the 1D solution, what we were doing is, well, we had some points, and we did a binary search, and we would like find this boundary. We would find at which array index it occurs. We would like identify the array index of this, and we would find this boundary. For example, like if this was the query boundary, we would basically find this index and find this index, <clears throat> and we could just subtract the two indices. We don't have to look at everything that's in between. If we want to just count the points, yeah, we don't. We don't actually have to. We, we don't have to go through everything that's in between these two boundaries in the 1D problem. Because in the 1D problem, we get a start index and we get an end, in, end index, and the count of points is n minus start. Not such luck here, right? Because here, the points are sorted by x coordinate, and so you get a start index and you get an end index. But you have to loop through all of them to check which ones have the y that's in bounds. We'll have to loop through each and every one of these points and check, like, is its y in this target rectangle? It is its y well, like within this band. So does that make sense? Um, and do you see like uh, you know why the solution for the one D version of the problem is efficient, and why you know the solution for the two D version of the problem at this point is not really efficient? I mean, it's it seems like a notable improvement over the naive method of just scanning everything, but it doesn't really solve the problem. Okay. So now, whenever we have a problem that is about, I don't know, um, finding out some property of a range of things, so here, you know, here, sure, there's two dimensions, but whenever we have any problem that's about finding out, uh, you know, what is some property of some sub-range of the array, like, like, like think of it this way. After we sort the array, okay, okay, so initially we have an array of points. After we sort it by x, it, you know, the, like each point is a two-tuple. Um, and think of it as like, you know, these are sorted by x. So on, right? Um, and now, like, let's say our query is like x1 equals a equals 8 x2 equals, uh, you know, whatever, uh, 35, well, let's say this next one is 40. 
Um, and then, you know, y1 equals 5 and y2 equals 10. So let's say, like, you know, this is 5, this is 10, and this is, like, 8, and this is 35. And this is, like, the rectangle we want to query. Uh, so so what, let's see what's happening here. Like, if we just sorted by x, and then we, we binary search for these coordinates of x, what do we get? We get indexes, right? We get basically these indexes. And now, the question we're asking is fundamentally a question that is about a, a, a subarray of the original array. We want to inquire about some property of the subarray, right? We have a specific subarray we've identified now. So after a log time binary search, we'll have identified this subarray. We'll have identified these indices. And now we have a question that is of the form, what is such and such property on array from i to j? On the, on, you know, the slice of the array from i to j. On the, this like slice of the array, what is, uh, what is the value of a certain property? And what property do we care to inquire about? It is how many values are between, how many of the y values are between these two bounds. And that can further be decomposed uh, into a somewhat simpler question. We can just ask two separate questions about how many values are like greater than a certain value. Like we can ask how many y values are greater than five and how many y values are greater than 10. We can subtract one from the other. To know like, how many are between 5 and 10, we can make it simpler by just saying, like, OK, how many are more than 10, and how many are more than 5? And then in the, in the, however many are more than 5, we'll subtract the number that are more than 10, and then whatever's left is the ones that are between 5 and 10. So now we have a setup where we're asking about some property of a subarray. And so that should kind of like, at this point, that should kind of scream segment tree to you, right? Because because previously, like whenever we've had this issue, that's how we've answered this. We've answered this by saying, by, by saying, uh, you, like, like just every other problem, whenever we want to know something about a contiguous subarray of an array, we use a segment tree to answer it. So now we just have to ask, what information do we need to store at each index and at the summary layers as well to be able to answer this question. And the question is, within this segment, like within this piece, so first we will just give the answer you know, for just each one element, but then we'll have to do it as part of like summary structure. Uh, how, w within this segment of the array, how many, va how many uh, y values are greater than the given value? So uh, to kind of make it even more uh, plain about how it will work is, you know, what I'm proposing is that if we have this array, and this is like some y value, we'll fill in, you know, once we figure out what information we need to compute, we'll fill in the actual y values. But like, let's say these are your points. I mean, this very lopsided. Uh, but you know what I'm proposing here is that whatever, like the, the, this is, the, this is the, you know your sorted point array, your point array sorted by x, and we're going to add some kind of information here uh, about uh, about this particular piece of the array, and then we're going to build a summary on top of this. We're going to build these summary nodes on top of this that are also going to have some kind of information. And, you know, we'll, like, this will just follow our classic structure. Uh, you know, we'll build summary arrays until we have built up to an array of size one. So let's say, the, let's say we have in our data structure six points and they're sorted by x. Here, here they are sorted by x. Uh, now, the question I, in, I want to be able to ask is, how many points are have a y less than or greater than? Let's say let's let's use greater than. How many points have a y of greater than a certain number? So the query will be decomposed into segments. So in other words, if for example this is our range, like let's say our range ends up being this, 
right? Uh, the plan is that I will ask this component, you know, I will pick up whatever the answer is here, and I will pick up whatever the answer is here, and in this case, we can just sum them. Like, whatever, however many points are, like, within the scope of this block that are greater than the target y value, and however many points are within the scope of this block that are greater than the target y value, uh, they can just be added, right? Because these blocks are disjoint. These blocks have separate. This is responsible for one range of x values, and this is responsible for some disjoint range of x values. So we will just be able to sum this block and this block and get the answer. Or if, for example, you know, it, it's like this, that will be the same kind of decomposition uh, into queries that we're used to with segment trees. We will ask this block, then we will ask this block, then we will ask this block. Or if it had been like this, then we will ask this block and this block. Make sense? Uh, so now the question is like, what information do we need to store inside a block in order to be able to answer this question of how many values are there that have these y that have y coordinates within a certain range? So let me assign some sample y values. So you see, of course, the y values are not in any way sorted. Okay, so, so let's say these are, the, th these are the points. I went ahead and sorted them by x. Okay, what information do, does a summary block need to have so that for that summary block we can answer the question of like in this block how many points are less than a certain value? Oh, and keep in mind that like we, we need to answer the question efficiently in each block. Like every block will need to answer this question like super efficiently. Um, so here's what I propose. Uh, how about a sorted array of, of just the y values? So how, why, well, why does this work? Well, okay, so conceptually we basically put 6 here, we put 10 here. Um, maybe in practice we wouldn't duplicate them, but uh, okay. And basically what I propose to put here is like 6 comma 10. Like, now we have a segment tree with every node holding potentially an array. And here we will do 5, 9, which is the sorted value of this. And here we will have 7, 12. These are sorted. And then what does this block have? Well, this block has all the y values covered by this block, which is these and these, sorted. So 5, 6, 9, uh, note, by the way, that this can be sorted especially efficiently from these two, right? Because this is a merge. This, this is just a two-way merge. And then finally, the top layer will contain some information like this. <clears throat> uh, now, note this completely falls into, like you might say, that well, this is not a segment tree. It totally is a segment right? It's just a segment tree where the core t value type sorted each node is actually this time an array and not a uh, single value. And furthermore, uh, in fact, remember how we said that like segment trees are essentially just you do a divide and conquer algorithm and you record all the intermediate results, uh, which is useful because then if you need to change a value, uh, you, you, ch you change the value and you, you know, repeat only the calculations that depended on that value. Which is why you know, it's useful to record the intermediate results of a divided conquer algorithm. And that's essentially all a segment tree is. It's recording the intermediate results of a divided and conquer. Which algorithm is this that we are recording the intermediate values of? It's a very common algorithm. It's like a very like merge sort. Yeah, exactly. This is just this is just merge sort of the y values, right? Uh, the only difference is like we've recorded all the intermediate values. Like, like uh, look at just the y values. Right? Yeah, this is, this is a recording of merge sorting the y values. They're very, very, uh, I mean, I don't know, I think it's very like, elegant how, that's, how, how, how that turns out to be the case. Uh, why merge sort? Because we want merged arrays at every point. Now, why do we want merged arrays? It's because, let, let's say a query like this comes along, right? 
we will basically take this query and we'll decompose it into this block. Like, we will basically select this block and this block. And for each of the blocks we select, we will be able to, in logarithmic time, say how many points were within a certain y bound. So let's say our y1 is 5 and our y2 is, uh, I don't know, let's say it's 8. Um, when we select this block, we will efficiently, in a log time binary search, learn that there are two values that are within this range. And then here, we will also do a binary search. Well, I mean, we can, we're we always free to you know, put some logic that says if your array is super small, then don't actually do the binary search. But that's an optimization. Over here, we'll also do the binary search, and we'll say there are zero values that are in the span. We'll total up this and this, and we will say, OK, there are a total of two values. So how efficient is this algorithm? Well, how many cells do you visit in the segment tree? It's like any other segment tree analysis, with uh, two log n cells being the maximum that is visited. Um, how, how much work do you do per cell that you visit? For every cell that you visit, you have to binary search the array there. So that's, again, log time. So, look at the, so now the analysis of this is that the worst case performance is basically 2 log n times log n. So that actually gives you a log n squared. When the, when the little 2 appears here, it is the same as if I wrote like this. Uh, the, the key distinction is not to confuse it with log of n squared, which is totally different. Log of n squared is order log n because by properties of logarithms, this is equal to 2 log n. But this is like the square of the logarithm. Very interesting time complexity. You've probably never like, seen a time complexity like that. But it's basically just very natural because you take something that touches log n different things, and for each of the log n things, you know, it uh, has to do another operation inside of it that happens to be log n time. Uh, so it arises very naturally. And this solves the problem in log n squared time. Now, I mean, when I first saw this, I, I mean, I, I thought this was great. But uh, guess what? You can actually improve it even more. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a minute to think about it. I would sort of doubt that if you haven't seen this before, you will kind of come up with it. But, uh, you know, give it a shot. Like, the, the, the key uh, trick is, like, how do you avoid having to do a binary search in every cell? That is basically the key here to unlocking even better performance for this. Okay, so, like, a small hint I will start out with is basically I will say, like, in, uh, do it from the top down. And in the top array, you will do the full binary search. So in the top array, you will do the full binary search. If you do the, the full binary search on the top array, how can you avoid doing any more binary searches? Well, this is you know, not, easy, not an easy idea to find. If the bigger white body is not present in the right uh, binary, but the, you might um, exclude doing binary search in that. Case. Well, yes, yes, yes. But these are like specific cases. Like this is not guaranteed to always be the case, right? It could certainly be that like when we do the range five to eight, we find it here, like we find this here. But I mean, like, what if this was like three to twelve? Uh, you know, uh, well, well, in the, even even here, like the like the range five to eight is present both here and here. So like we can't in general just all like th that is a nice like um, heuristic to try out. Like what we can do is maybe we can look at like the minimum and the maximum value, and like we can not even go down a certain path if there's if like very quickly we can determine that there's nothing there. Uh, that's not a bad idea. I, I sort of like that, but um, the, the, you, you see how this cannot possibly be like an order. Like, like any kind of uh, asymptotic improvement, because we can't guarantee that the target range will be present in both halves. 
Uh, so the trick is you have to like augment this data structure with some additional pointers uh, that basically, uh, this is called cascading. You will cascade the binary search. So the idea is what if this five has a pre-stored pointer to uh, a similar location in this array. And here this five would like point to the seven which is the nearest value. So you basically, for every value in each array, you will attach two additional pointers to the array below it. So for example, the six will point here. And uh, this will point to also to the seven. The seven will point here. Like it points to like the next value, basically, if the same value isn't present. Uh, and here the seven will point here again. And the nine will point here. Well, here it points there. So, so you, you see the point of this. Like once you do the search on the top level of the array, you just follow the pointers to get to where you need to go. Um, you know, these can be like array indices. Basically, th think of it like for every or for every um, element here, there will be like an additional two elements stored with it, which, which will be like the index in here and the index in here. And once you do this, that means like without any additional binary searches, you will just propagate this everywhere you need, you need to go. Uh, because here there will also be pointers start to the ne down to the next level and so on. So after the original binary search, you will never have to binary search again. So I didn't really, know, I didn't really understand on the, like say for the five, on the right hand side there is no five. So how can you... Oh yeah, yeah. So, so the definition is just Every element points to its successor in the corresponding array. Uh, well, every element points either to the first occurrence of itself, or if it doesn't occur, then to its successor. Because basically, if 5 doesn't occur here, it's okay for us to simplify the search to 7. Right? I mean, if, if this 5 cannot occur here, then we can just search for the 7. Like, we can convert the query of 5 to 8, for all intents and purposes, the same as seven to eight when searching this. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the idea. This is not an easy idea to find, to like augment it with pointers like that, but it's de definitely like a very nice idea. And once you, if you do this, I mean, this certainly requires like extra space, like you might not even want this, but okay, I mean, it's only, uh, like, it only increases, it basically triples the amount of space needed. Like, for every element, you will need, like, two additional pointers. Uh, well, triples, or exact, the exact constant factor may depend on your implementation. But assuming they're kind of all integers, triples, maybe. Uh, so it only linearly increases the amount of space used. Uh, and, yes, the, uh, how does this affect the time complexity? Well, now, actually, each one can be done in order uh, well, so now you need an, an initial order log n binary search, um, and then you will pay, well, and then, and, and then for up to this many values, you will pay order one. Constant time. Yeah, constant time. So now this simplifies to log n and log n, and this is order log n. And so the whole problem can be solved in like log n for even a, an entire box query. So during the first binary search, you will find all the uh, coordinates which would be counted. Well, you would find this like particular Y band you're interested in. Yeah. You would find it in here. So for example, you would find like this range. And then you would kind of propagate this down so you never have to binary search. Uh, like it's still the same. Oh, okay, okay. So like the algorithm for identifying which cells you need to examine so that you don't examine all of them is the same as if you, you know, do a uh, top-down query of the segment tree. Now it has to be top-down because you have to follow these pointers. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so instead of querying the segment tree like any way we want, now, now we have to do like the top-down query algorithm of the segment tree. So we can follow the pointers from the top. We do the search at the top. From there we just you know, follow the pointers so that to, whenever we would recurse on either the left or right subpath, we follow the pointers so that we don't have to pay for the binary search again. So yeah, uh, so, so this is kind of how you can solve this sort of like point uh, counting problem. Um, now just a couple uh, 
additions to this. Uh, what if you know the problem was kind of what I originally stated, which is not just count the points, but also like get their average. How can we uh, how can we do that? Well, actually, this isn't too bad, right? Yeah, because we just need kind of like some additional um, summation. Uh, so to do this, like basically, um, it's enough to yeah, because these are static, we can just basically do like the cumulative sum trick. Uh, so let's say this has like a third element associated with it, which is like some, you know, value. Yeah, some like temperature or whatever of the temperature sensor. So let's say this one's 60 degrees or whatever. Uh, let's say T equals temperature is 60 degrees. That would just be an additional attribute that would come here. And then um, in these sorted arrays, what we would do is uh, we, need, we need to ensure that when we query for a particular Y range, we can quickly sum up everything that's in that range. Uh, so let, let's say um, this one had like temperature 100 and this one had temperature 60. So then I'm associating temperature 100 with this one and temperature 60 with this one, which means that I, will, I would build like a temperatures cumulative array that would look like uh, 100 and 160. Uh, th this is so that I can get the sum of a range quickly. Like this one, basically this one corresponds to 100, and this one, this one corresponds to the value 60, but it's a cumulative array, so it's going to be like 100, 160. Um, and, then, and, and then when we binary search this array, we will get some subrange of it, and then we will basically subtract one number from the other. Like for example, if our search only contains this 10, we will do 160 minus 100. This is like the classic cumulative sum trick. Uh, there's nothing uh, particularly fancy here, right? If I ask you, if I, if, if I just ask you this problem in uh, one dimension, it would probably be pretty clear how to do it, right? Uh, it, like, like if this is confusing, you just uh, think about how you would solve the problem in one dimension, right? Like you have like a one-dimensional span and you have temperature sensors. And let's say, you know, now we not only want to count how many there are, but we want to also get the sum. And then when we get the sum, we will also get the count, and we will do like sum divided by count, and that will give us the average. So we already solved the counting problem. That was just a binary search in the 1D version. How do we, how do we solve the uh, summing version? Or how do we solve the summing issue? Well, you know, same way, but we, in addition to just having like a sorted array, you also need to have like a cumulative array of the temperatures, so that you can subtract one number from the other and get the answer. <clears throat> like basically, if you find that the fraction of the array you want to query goes from index 1 to 5, you will say, OK, what is the sum of all the temperatures up to the fifth index, and subtract the sum of all the temperatures from before the first index. And you will get all the sums in that range. You will divide by the count, and you will uh, you know, you, for each cell, we will be able to say what that number is efficiently. And of course, we will have to, you know, store that kind of array in like every cell. Mm -hmm. So how is this excluding the x values that aren't part of that, those y points? The x values or the y values? I mean, excluding the temperatures for the x values that you don't want. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like just a little bit out of space here, which is why I don't show it explicitly. Let me, um, well, okay. Okay, I mean, let's, I'll just, I'll just show for like four items or something. Yeah, so, so, so basically, uh, well, let's say um, for this one, the temperature is 100. This one, the temperature is 60. This one, the temperature is uh, 50. And this one is uh, 40. Right. Uh, the, the idea here will be that um, you know here we'll just create an array that just has a hundred. Uh, this one will have sixty. This one will have fifty. This one will have forty. And here, basically, when we sort these y values, we will kind of sort the temperatures together with them. So, like, we will kind of bring an array here that will be like one hundred and sixty. Um, likewise, we will kind of make sure we include this information in all the higher levels. So, for example, here, um, 
Here, the array will be 40, 50. Why 40, 50 and not 50, 40 is because we are respecting the order of the Y, like this 5 corresponds to this 40, and this 9 corresponds to this 50. They're at the same index. And like, but, but here, the 6 is with this 100. Like, they, they could be part of the same array. Like, this could be like a tuple in this array. Um, but conceptually, like, just, you know, there can be two arrays as well. Okay, and so after you have that, th this is basically like the temperature array aligned with this array. And here the temperature array looks like, um, it looks like, what, five, 5 is 40, 6 is 100, 9 is 50, and 10 is 60. But now, in order to query the sum efficiently, we have to make it a cumulative array. Right, because otherwise, how will you query the sum efficiently? Like, let's say I tell you I want everything between index 0 and 3 here. You would have to manually go and add that up, right? But to prevent that, you will have to make this a cumulative array. Like one that, it, like one that would then just sums all the elements starting from the zero position. So, so we will basically make these like so. Uh, we'll make this like 140, and then we'll add this to this, make this 190, and make this like 250. So we'll have a cumulative temperature array that is aligned with these values in, in every cell. And then when it comes time to query, we will query you know, some subset. Uh, we'll query some subrange of each array that we touch. And there we will use the cumulative arrays to figure out the sum as well as the count. And then we can get the average too. Mm -hmm. So after you have uh, augmented the pointers, uh, you, you're still finding a range at the top level, correct? Like, yeah. say, from 6 to 10, say. Uh, you're, are you asking about these, like, cascade pointers? Yes, correct. So, okay. So suppose you find a range that you care about uh -huh. six, from 6 to 10, right? Uh -huh. So that means you need to follow every number from 6 to 10 down, right? Um, well, you only follow the ones that are, like, within your segments that you would from the X side. That you No, no. I mean, it's the same, well, it's the same analysis as for a segment tree in general. Uh, so, so basically, okay, okay, so how would a query work here? Like, let's say you get um, X1 equals, uh, um, what, what do I want? Like, how about, how about seven? How about seven? Uh, so it will begin here, and the window will end, oh, I don't know, how about here? Uh, so x2 equals, uh, I'm going to go for x2 equals uh, 50. So this ends, path, this ends somewhere in here, like this is the x1, so it ends like somewhere here, and it begins like somewhere in between here. Uh, so what will happen is, I will actually, like if I want to do the whole cascading trick, I will enter at the top. Uh, well, I'm assuming all the pointers will have been set up. For clarity here, I will only draw the pointers that I'm actually following. Uh, so. But, but really, it's important to understand like every element has the two pointers in this case. Uh, so x1 equals 7. So basically, um, well, uh, uh, so essentially like this node, like, so, so you have to, um, yeah, okay. I mean, I mean there, is, there is like first a step where you basically figure out like what, uh, what, what bottom range this corresponds to. So like first you will search in like the base array uh, just for the x's here. So you, can get, so you can get basically this index of i equals one and uh, this index of j equals two, three, four. So, so, so this part is like not, uh, this is just to kind of like reduce the problem to the classic segmentary problem where you actually have the indices, right? So we will basically get, get i equals one, j equals four here. So this is like an additional login step. I guess I didn't count that at first, but okay, fine. Uh, there's yeah, there's one more like login step, but it doesn't change the final complexity. Uh, so uh, after we get that, we we will basically say, okay, I want all the you know I want indices one to four. Uh, based on basically the size of my array, I would determine that this is a query that must affect both this side and this side. Uh, then I would, you know, look for these values and follow the pointers. So here I will basically follow the five here. I will look for eight. I don't find eight, so I will follow the pointer for nine. 
And likewise, here I will find this 5 and I will follow the pointer to uh, 7. Um, and, you know, this uh, 8, uh, well, okay, I mean, again, it's 9. Uh, I follow the pointer to the 12. So, so far, these are basically the pointers I follow. And, and here I will essentially obtain, like, an index in this array. I will obtain, uh, I, I will, like, from these values, I will know that I have two elements in this range. I will know that there's two elements apart between these. So basically, 5 and 6 are within my range, but 9 is the first element that's outside. So here I will know to count 2. Uh, except I must figure out, um, I, I, I will have to say, like, do I count 2 here, or do I need to recurse further? And that will basically depend, because um, here i equals 1, and, and so um, this element, uh, yeah, it, when I did the previous example, I had i is 0. I, I think in the previous example I had, when I said it was going to be this one and this one, it's, it's because I had like x1 set to like 4 or something. something. So I, I had like i equals 0. So if you have i equals 0, then you will say, look, this cell completely covers uh, or the query is com uh, the query is completely covering this cell. So take this cell, and then we will count. We will do the binary search here. But if, for example, i equals one, you will say, you know, if, if like x one was seven or something, so i equals one, you will say, actually, this cell covers more than just this query. It covers index zero, and uh, our query just starts at one. So then, instead, you recurse. But this is the same analysis as like the top-down traversal of the segment tree, which we uh, covered last time. Uh, th this, is, th this is just that same analysis of like whether a cell is partially covered or fully covered. In the end, you will only, you will only evaluate two log n cells. Uh, at every level, there can, at, at every level, there can only be like essentially one cell that is partially covered, and only one cell will. Uh, only up to like two log n cells will be visited total, up to two in each level. Uh, yeah, we, we, we did the analysis of that one last time, but it's, it's not any different from like the standard uh, segment <coughs> segmentary analysis. I just wanted to see the tip pointer for me now. Yeah, so for example, here, like, because this, because this one is only partially covered, it'll have to recurse on the two halves. Uh, like, this pointer will, you know, this 5 will again move down here, and this 9 will move here, and you know, the, the, these will move around like that. Uh, but it, it, it's easy to follow these because these pointers are all pre-computed. Uh, like, like all the pointers are pre-computed when you build the tree. Oh, uh, how do you pre-compute the pointer efficiently? I mean, it's not very hard, right? You can create the pointers when you're merging. Like you, you created this array by merging these two. You can, you can, you know, just it, create the pointers when you're merging, and that's the easiest way to do it. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, I mean, implementing this from start to end, like, is a lot of implementation. Like, it wouldn't be, you know, an interview question. Uh, but yeah, if you want to, like, get better at these concepts, like, you can definitely, like, try implementing this. I think, like, this is a great problem to try to implement a solution for.